So uh, I guess the title of today's message will be um, How do we prepare for the end times? Um, you've all heard that we're living in the end times. Um, but I mean, really, is it the end times? And, and if it is the end times, how far along are we? Okay. Uh, the Bible gives, does not give specific dates like, you know, April 15th, 2020. The Bible ha does not have dates like that uh, because, you know, they use different calendars at different time periods. But the Bible does give signs that we're approaching the end times, okay? So what are these signs and how can we know about some of these signs? And one of the signs that the Bible gave, that Jesus gave, uh, is the parable of the fig tree, okay? So let's read about that in Matthew chapter 24. Verses 32 through 33. So in Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 through 33, this is what it says. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. So this is the parable that Jesus gave. Okay? And this actually is a parable about the end times. So when it talks about the, the fig tree, in the Bible, the fig tree symbolizes the nation of Israel. Okay? And the people of Israel. So the parable says, if you see it, the fig tree coming back to life, putting forth buds and leaves, then you know that the end is near. So how are we supposed to understand this parable? Well, it's talking about the nation of Israel. It will basically disappear. It's going to die. And then when you see Israel come back to life, that'll be a sign that you are nearing the end time. So let's look at the history of Israel. When did it actually like disappear like that? Well, after Jesus died in AD 70, the Romans, basically they had control over Israel, but the Israelites kept revolting. So the Romans came in and basically destroyed the nation, destroyed Jerusalem, burned down the temple. And not only that, they scattered all the Israelites across the Roman Empire. They did not let the Israelites live in their own land. They kicked them all out. Okay. So since AD 70, the nation of Israel did not have a country of their own. They were homeless, basically. Okay. So when did this nation Israel start to come back to life? That in the parable, Jesus expresses it as putting forth buds and then leaves. Then, you know, summer is near, right? Well, in the Bible, summer in Israel, summer is harvest time. Okay, not like here. Here is fall or autumn is harvest time, right? In the Middle East, summer is harvest time. So when it says summer is near, it means harvest is near. And harvest in the Bible is a metaphor for judgment times, right? Because in harvest, what do you do? You cut down the sheaves, you take the grain and you put it into your uh, storage barn but you take the chaff and you burn it, right? Jesus used that parable. So the chaff are the ones who are getting judgment. The grain are the ones who have the fruits of faith. So they're going to, into the storage of heaven, right? So when it says that summer is near, that means that harvest time and judgment is near. So when did Israel come back to life? Okay. So in order to know this, we, know to, we need to know a little bit about history, right? In 1917, that's in the 20th century, right? 1917, almost 2,000 years later. That's when World War I was going on, and it was almost over. And who won? Well, you know, the British, Americans, and the French, etc. The Allied forces won, right? So Britain basically 
because they were winning, they took control over the Middle East, especially over Palestine. And when they took control over Palestine, in 1917, they made something called the Balfour Declaration. Balfour was the prime minister of Britain at the time. So what did this de declaration say? This declaration said that all Jews could return home to their land to Palestine, to Israel. So this was called Zionism, going back to Zion, their homeland. So this was the beginning of what Jesus was talking about, the parable of the fig tree, okay? 2000 years has passed. This country was totally gone. This has never happened in history where a country disappeared for almost 2000 years and then it just comes back to life, okay? So in 1917, they were told that they could return home. And then in 1945, after the war was over, uh, the world, that's World War II, right? And then in 1948, they became independent. They gained independence. Okay. But when they gained independence, they still did not have Jerusalem. They got most of the country back, but Jerusalem, the capital, the most important city, uh, was still in the hands of Muslims, okay? And then in 1967, they fought something called the Six Days War, in which Israel fought against 12 of the surrounding Middle East nations, and they won in six days. It was like of a miracle basically and what's the point of this war through this war they regained jerusalem okay but even though they regained jerusalem they didn't regain all of jerusalem they still haven't regained one portion which is the temple mount that is still in the hands of um you know islam muslim people right so instead of the temple being there on Temple Mount, they have, uh, you know, this Muslim, uh, Muslim temple, basically. So they still have not retained that portion of the land, which is the most important part. You know, the most important part of Jeru uh, Israel is Jerusalem. The important, most important part of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount, where the temple is supposed to be established. But that still uh, is in the hands of Muslims. Okay, so this is basically what Jesus' parable means. So that means we are very close to the end times, right? This happened in the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. Okay, and then let's talk about um, Revelation chapter 6. Please go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Revelation chapter 6 talks about the seals, the seven seals uh, that God is unsealing. Okay? Remember uh, the scroll, the Bible had seven seals. It was sealed with seven sealed seals. And Jesus received this book and he started to open, break open each of these seals one by one. And every time he broke open a seal, um, a, a plague or some kind of a, a woe, happened some kind of a judgment happened in the world and we're going to look at the first four seals okay so revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through 8 says then i saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals and i heard one of the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder come i looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer so the first seal you saw a white horse and this white horse went out to conquer, okay? So what does that mean? Many people think the white horse symbolizes Jesus Christ or the returning Christ because it's a white horse. And if you look in Revelation 19, the returning Christ is riding on a white horse. Of course, the, the color white is symbolically, you know, is good. However, here, this, is, this white horse does not symbolize the returning Christ 
but actually it is the Antichrist. Okay? The white horse symbolizes the Antichrist. And the Bible clearly says that Satan and his minions are able to mimic and imitate uh, the angels of light and imitate uh, angels of God. So the Antichrist is clearly imitating Jesus Christ by riding on the white horse. And we know that this is not Christ because uh, this white horse goes out to conquer. Okay. Uh, this white horse goes out to conquer. And the world right now, Jesus told us, belongs to Satan. Okay. So he, Satan, the Antichrist, came and conquered the world. And we're going to see through history when that actually happens. Of course, it's been happening for a long time, but we'll see more clearly. And then verse 3 says, When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. And another, a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. The second seal brought forth a red horse, and the red horse symbolizes war okay a great sword was given to him uh, to bring forth wars okay and then verse five when he broke the third seal i heard the third living creature saying come i looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quarter of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. The third seal brought forth a black horse and the black horse, what is the black horse? It's saying that there is not enough food, right? So in verse six, when it's talking about a quart of wheat for a denarius, a denarius is like a lot of money. It's like $10,000 or more. So a quart of wheat, a little bit of wheat like this would cost like $10,000. Just imagine that. Okay, what is that symbolizing? That's talking about a famine. There's so, such a shortage of food that a little bit of wheat would cost that much money. Okay? So the third seal is famine. <clears throat> and then verse 7, when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. The fourth seal brought forth an ashen horse. Some uh, versions translate this as a pale horse. Okay, a pale horse. And what was the name of the uh, person riding on it? It was Death, and Hades was following him. So what is this? What is death? In Greek, the word for death is thanatos. So for Avengers fans, I guess Thanos, Thanos, whatever, the bad guy, that word comes from this word. Thanatos means death in Greek. But this is the word in the Septuagint, the LXX means Septuagint. You guys know what a Septuagint is? Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Greek Old Testament. It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So in the Septuagint, wherever the word plague or pestilence occurs in the Old Testament Hebrew, that word is translated by using the Greek word thanatos. Okay, so thanatos, Thanatos means death, but it also means plague or pestilence. So the fourth seal is pestilence or plague, like a contagious disease, you know, like COVID-19. Okay, that's the fourth seal. Okay, so these are the four seals that will happen in the end times. Okay, first, the white horse goes out to conquer. Second, the red horse goes out to get, bring war everywhere. Third is the black horse brings famine. Fourth is the ashen or pale horse that brings death or pestilence, contagious disease. And then uh, the second half of verse 8 says, Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So this sentence basically summarizes verses 1 through 8. 
Okay, so this is a summary statement. These four seals, these, these four horses are sent out to kill with sword, meaning war, and then with famine, and then with pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. That, that last part is confusing. We never had a wild beast during these four seals, right? What is that wild beast talking about? That wild beast is talking about the first seal, which was the white horse who went out to conquer. Now, how do I know that? How do we know that? Okay, this is where we need to, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. We need to understand some history. When the Bible talks about wild beasts, it's what, what is it talking about? Especially in Revelation. We know that the book of Revelation is a very symbolic book, right? So when it's talking about wild beasts, what is it saying? Does it really mean like lions and tigers are going to come and kill people? Probably not, right? So what does that mean? Well, if you look in Revelation chapter 13, it talks about two beasts, right? The beast from the earth and then another beast from the sea. And who are these beasts? Well, they're the, the false prophet and the Antichrist. Okay, so let's look at Psalm 49, verse 20. Okay, oops. Psalm 49, verse 20. So Psalm 49, verse 20 says this. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. Okay, so basically what this verse is saying is that a human being who does not have the spirit of God, who does not believe in God, who completely denies the spiritual world and denies the existence of God, in God's eyes, those kinds of human beings are like beasts. And that's how the Bible interprets this word. Whenever the Bible uses the word beast, we have to think about it like that. A human being that has no spirit of God, that does not believe in God, that denies God altogether are like beasts. So the, in Revelation, it's saying that in the first seal with the white horse went out to conquer, that it is equating that with wild beasts. Why, why is that? Okay. How does the white horse conquer that they would call it a wild beast? Okay, well, this is the Antichrist. And how do they conquer? They don't conquer by killing or with power, with swords or anything like that. But they conquer with thought. They conquer with ideas. They conquer with beliefs. And they conquer with world views. The beast in the, in the book of Revelation does this. Okay. And they seal. The people who have not been sealed with the seal of God. The beast seals them with the sign 666. Right. Okay. So what is all this? this is, if we get any deeper into this, it may get confusing. So what am I talking about here? This, I'm talking about in history when human beings decided to leave God and deny God's existence and deny the spiritual world and say that matter is all that exists. Only the things that you see, that's all that exists. Okay. Right now, we're living in that kind of an era. Okay. You know, at church, we talk about God and the spiritual world among ourselves. But when you go out into the world, and even at school, when they're talking, basically everybody talks with the assumption that the spiritual world doesn't exist. Okay? Only what you see and what you can touch exists. That is the worldview that is ruling over the world right now. Okay? So that's the white horse that conquered. That worldview has conquered the world right now. And we're living in that kind of a world. You guys must understand that. And when did that start? When did that begin? And the Bible calls that kind of a worldview the worldview of the beast. That is the beastly worldview. Okay? Because the beast, human beings, we've learned this, but humans have spirit, 
soul and body, right? Human beings have these three parts, but animals or beasts do not have the spirit. They have only soul and body. There is no spirit. Okay, that's the main difference between humans and beasts. Right, so if even if you are a human being, if your spirit is dead because you deny the existence of God, that means you're basically the same as a beast. That's why the Bible calls that kind of a human being a beast. And from there, we could continue and say a beast, beastly worldview is a worldview that denies the existence of a spiritual world. Okay? That's a beastly worldview. And what the Bible here in Revelation chapter 6 is trying to tell us is that that beastly worldview has now conquered the world that we're living in. So when did that happen? When did that beastly worldview conquer earth like this? Okay. Well, in history, in, in Western civilization, not in Asia or other parts of the world, you know, in America and Europe, in Western civilization, we say modern modernity began in the 16th century. And when did modern times begin? It began with the Protestant Reformation. Okay, we've all heard about the Protestant Reformation, right? You know, when Luther brought out the 95 Theses and he revolted against the Catholic Church, that was the Protestant Reformation. That was a good thing, right? For us, it was a good thing. Okay, but that is the beginning of modern era. Why? Because with the Protestant Reformation, what did Luther contend? He said, everyone should have the right to read the Bible on their own. Because before then, normal people like you and I, we didn't, have, we didn't get to read the Bible. They didn't give us the Bible. Only the Pope and the priests had the Bible. And then they would read the Bible to the people and teach the Bible, they would not let normal lay people read the Bible. So what Luther was saying is, no, we're all equal before God. So we all should have a Bible of our own. And that was a great thing that enabled all of us to read the Bible on our own, right? The word of God. But like I said last week, because human beings are fallen, and when we fell, what did we eat? We ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? So because of that, good and evil are in all of us. Every single person has good and evil in them. And not only that, everything that a human being does, that a fallen human being does, has both good and evil in it. So there may be good aspects about it, but there's also evil aspect about it. And it's the same thing with this. The Protestant Reformation brought a great, uh, you know, change to the world, but it also had a side effect, which was because of the Protestant Reformation, individual liberty became a big thing. And again, this is a good thing, right? To have individual liberty is a good thing, but human beings misuse this for their own good, for their own pleasure, for sin. So ever since then, ever since modern times, human beings God gave them individual liberty to be able to serve God and live the way they want to. But now they took that and they started to live a life that went against God's will. They started to drift away from God. Okay. And so since the 16th century, we've had things like the scientific revolution. And then we had the enlightenment. And then we had the Industrial Revolution, right? So this was the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. This sounds sounding like a history class, right? So all these things we learned is a good thing, right? These are all good things that brought about a, a lot of technological advances and increase, you know, uh, our 
our life became better because of all these things, right? But from a spiritual standpoint, this is not the case. Especially during the Enlightenment, what happened was, this is when people started to say that there is no God. And they said, all we need is human reason. Human reason is so good and so perfect that if we could just come together and unite and use our minds and use the resources in the world, then we're going to have infinite progress. That's what they were saying. So from this point on, the spiritual world was denied. God, they said, there is no God. Human reason is God. Okay. And then, but technologically, scientifically, they were really advancing. There really was progress. There really was a lot of good things going on. And especially in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, everyday life got better because of these things. They got, you know, electricity, the steam engine, whatever, all these good things, right? So, like they said, they were really pro progressing, advancing like this. And then 20th century came. What happened? In early 20th century, 1914, World War I began. It was the most, you know, devastating war in human history. It was the biggest war ever. It was a world war. So many people died, right? And, you know, we've heard of, in 1918, we've heard now that there was a Spanish flu pandem pandemic, right? And, like, 50 million people died or something like that. In the war, like, 40 million people died. So the pandemic killed more people. So during this time, a lot of people died. Almost like a fourth of the world died or something like that, according to some statistics. Okay? So this is what human reason brought about when human beings use their reason their intellectual mind they thought there would only be progress but ultimately what happened that progress resulted in you know this advancement in the ability to kill each other with weapons okay and then in 1929 what happened great depression happened Financially, that's like a famine. And then in 1939, World War II started again. One of the results of World War I was that, you know, as I said before, before Zionism, Israel was able to go back to their homeland in 1917. One of the results of the World War II is Israel's independence. So these wars, even though they are sort of like the judgment upon the world, they also have effects where it is fulfilling God's history of redemption. So the Bible clearly says that we will have a third world, world war. And that'll be the final judgment. And sometimes in the Bible, that's called the Armageddon. Okay. So if you look at this history... Around the 17th, 18th century right here, this is when the beastly worldview started to take over. In the Middle Ages, it was bad. Life was pretty, you know, bleak. But one good thing was everybody believed in God back then. Now, with the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, life got better, a lot of techno technological advances. But now nobody believes in God. Most of the world doesn't believe in God. They're denying God. So that is when that white horse, the conquering began. The conquering by the beastly worldview. So since then, until now, the whole world is now living under the assumption that there's no God, that there's no spiritual world. Only those of us who go to church and believe in God talk about this, right? If you go out into the world, into society, into at school, you know, when you talk about these things, there may be some others who are Christians, but most of the people deny a spiritual world, deny God, okay? Or at least they have to in order to play in, you know, in the big world right now, okay? So that has already happened. 
that conquering has already taken place. And then the second horse was the red horse, wars, right? So result of that was war, what? Wars, World War I and World War II. So some people say the 20th century is a century of wars. That, that entire century was full of wars. It was a never ending war. After World War II, there was other wars, Korean War, Vietnam War, you know, the Cold War, Gulf War, everything. It was all about wars, okay? And then after the war was what? A famine, right? We've already had the Great Depression. We've already had other famines in the world, okay? And, and then the last one was pestilence. And in 1918, we've already had the Spanish flu pandemic, which was like the biggest pandemic in history, I think. And right now we're living through another pandemic, right? So the reason why I wanted to talk about this tonight is because I want us to realize this may not be like the end right now, the world's not gonna end tomorrow, but what I'm trying to show you through this history is that we are very close to the end times. We're approaching the end times. In fact, we're living through the end times right now. That's my belief because the beastly worldview has already conquered the world. The world has already seen a century of wars already. Famines and pestilences are happening at a rapid pace and we're living through a pandemic right now. So in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, sword, famine, and plague, these three always go together. Okay, these three always go together. And right now, we're, the pandemic, we could say, is a plague, right? And after a plague, there may be a recession. That's like a famine. And when recessions come, sometimes nations go to war. And if this really happens, then we can see that we're really cl getting close to the end times. So in such a time like this, what do we need to do, okay? What is our responsibility as Christians, okay? And the person that, uh, the character in the Bible that is going to show us or set an example for us is Daniel. It, Daniel was living through a time like this because Daniel was in Babylonian captivity, right? And this is what we need to understand. One of the reasons why God brings about these kinds of plagues and wars and famines is so, there are two reasons for this, two purposes, okay? One reason is to punish the unbelieving, sinful humankind. But the second reason is to train up and refine the believers so that they are prepared for the great tribulation of the end times. Okay. And one of the ways he does that is by bringing these kinds of hardships, these kinds of trials in the world, he's going to enable us to be prepared. If we are wise, if we have faith, we will see these signs and we will prepare ourselves for judgment that is to come. Okay, and one of the ways that we need to prepare is we need to be prepared to leave this world. Okay, let's turn to Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. So here, when it says come out of her, it's talking about Babylon. Okay, the world was compared to Babylon. See, verse two says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So we need to come out of her. When, when we see that God is judging the world, we need to be prepared to leave. And by leaving, I'm not talking about, you know, leaving earth to go somewhere else. By leaving, what I'm trying to say is we need to live a life that is set apart, different from the people of this world. Okay completely separated that's the kind of life that abraham lived right he was a foreigner he lived a different kind of a lifestyle and that's what god is expects of us and when these kinds of tribulations come upon the world this is a sign telling us you need to be ready by preparing yourselves by living a set apart life and daniel showed that in babylonian captivity right 
He was living in Babylon, just like us. We're living in Babylon right now. Babylon is a world that is ruled over by the beastly worldview. So what did Daniel do? When Daniel realized in Daniel chapter 9, when Daniel realized that Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah, and he realized that the Babylonian captivity was only supposed to be 70 years. And then when he read this verse, it's just like a lightning hit him in the head. He realized, we've been here 68 years. We only got two years left. We need to get ready to leave. But he saw the people, the Israelites living in Babylon, nobody was ready to leave yet. By, after 70 years, they had settled down. They had acclimated to Babylon. Their life was now in Babylon. They bought homes. They, bought, you know, they were farming or whatever. They, nobody wanted to go back. And there was only two years left. And after Daniel realized this, he was determined to pray and intercede on behalf of the people so that God's word will be fulfilled, that when 70 years comes, that the people will be ready to leave. So let's turn to Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, this is what it says. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the numbers of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. See? So Daniel read Jeremiah and he realized that God has set the time as 70 years. And he realized that they were very close. So in verse 3, he says, So I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So in verse 3, after he realized this, what did he do? He set his face. It says he gave his attention, right? In Hebrew, that literally means he set his face to pray to God. And the, in Hebrew, set his face means he was determined. He was determined to pray to God. Okay. Daniel was determined to pray so that God's word will be fulfilled and when the 70th year comes, that his people will be able to go back to the promised land. Okay, So this is the kind of heart that we need to have. All these signs of the end times, I believe, are really telling us that we're really nearing the end times. And if we realize this, like Daniel, when he realized that the end of Babylonian captivity is near, he was determined to pray about this. So we need to pray about this as well. Okay, we need to pray. So what kind of prayer did Daniel give? Starting from verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said. So from verse 4 on, it's all about confessing their sins. The first part of Daniel's prayer is all about confessing and repentance. Okay, the first part of his prayer is confession and repentance. Now this repentance can be both personal, but also for Daniel, it was national. He was interceding on behalf of his people. He was repenting of the nation's sins, the nation of Israel. This is what is needed today, I believe, especially here in America. Right now, we need to intercede on behalf of this nation. We need to pray. We got to repent. We have to seek God's face humbly and you know, pray to him so that he may heal our country, right? Especially here in New York. We really need healing right now. And that's the kind of prayer that Daniel gave. He said, he prayed to my God, right? He said, Allah, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Verse 5, he says, we have sinned, right? So from here on, he's confessing of all the things that they've done. And the main point is this. What, what is their main sin? They did not keep God's word. They did not keep God's covenant. Okay, that is the main point of his confession. And then secondly, what made Daniel pray? What made Daniel pray? 
two things. One, the events of his day. The things that are going on around him made him pray. Life in captivity was getting hard, right? A new king just came into power. The events of his day drove him to pray. And that applies to us today, right? The things that are going on around us right now should drive us to pray. The coronavirus crisis is something that should make us all humbly kneel before God and pray right now. This is a time to pray. If, if any time we pray, we got to pray now. Okay? And then secondly, what drove Daniel pray, to pray? The word of God drove him to pray. Because when he was reading God's word, he realized that the end was near. The end of captivity was near. So that drove him to pray. So today through this Bible study, we just learned that we're nearing the end times. We're living in the end times. We've seen a lot of signs that has already happened. Right? That should really make us pray. That we are prepared for the end times. First, we have to repent of our personal sins so that we are right before God. Secondly, we need to intercede and pray for our nation for healing so that God's chosen people will return back to him. Okay. And we got to pray for our church and our family, for our well-being, that we're able to go through the trials without losing our faith. Okay. So Daniel was determined to pray like this. Okay. And the reason why he was able to pray is because in Daniel chapter 9, verses 17 through 19, did Daniel pray because he himself thought that he was righteous before God? The Bible does not say that, right? Why did Daniel pray? Because in Daniel chapter 9, verses 17, it says, So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. So the reason why Daniel was able to pray, he's praying saying, God, do this for your own sake right? In verse 17, he says, for your own sake. And then in verse 18, he says, we're not praying because of, uh, on account of any merits of our own. He's saying, we don't have any merits to come before you. We've done nothing good, but we're praying on account of your great compassion. Daniel was able to pray because he trusted in God's great compassion. So that's why we need to pray right now, because our God is a compassionate God. And sometimes he may set judgment. He, he may say, oh, I'm going to punish the world. But if enough people come together and pray and repent to God, God changes his heart because he's compassionate and merciful. So that's why we need to pray right now. Okay? And we need to pray so that we are able to go through the trials and tribulations that may be coming in the future without losing our faith. Because that's the one thing that Satan is going to try to do. He's going to try to shake up the believers so that they lose their faith and they deny God because of their tribulations. Okay, let's look at one verse before we end tonight. Let's go to Revelation chapter 9, verses, whoops, Revelation chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. So Revelation chapter 9, verses 3 through 5 says, Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. They, will they were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. So one of the things that happens in the end times is spiritual locusts. These are not real locusts. God sends spiritual locusts and they have the power of scorpions and they sting like scorpions. So what, is this all, what does all this mean? This is done to torment the people so that they will deny God. They will curse God and leave God. 
This is done to drive people away from their faith. And only the people who have the seal of God on their foreheads will be able to resist this. So this is one of the, the main attacks that Satan does to God's people. So all the things that happen, like wars, famines, pestilences, like contagious diseases, these kinds of things that are happening right now, all of these things are happening to shake up the people of God so that they would let go of their faith, that they would leave their faith. And then another side of that is that uh, these things are also happening to judge the unbelievers. But for us believers, he's trying to make us leave God. So we need to be prepared to be able to endure through the trials and not leave the faith. So we're going to continue uh, this kind of study at the next week, and we'll talk about how we could do that. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this Bible study to be able to learn of your word and to be able to learn the signs of the times and to be able to understand through your word where we are in these end times. God, I pray that you will enable us to truly be prepared so that we may be strengthened in our faith and sealed in our minds and in our hearts so that no matter what happens, our faith may grow stronger and that we may never leave your word, but may we always be able to walk with you no matter what kind of hardships or trials may come our way. Please watch over all of our evergreen church members and seal them with your word and watch over them like the apple of your eye and protect them from the virus that is going on right now. And I pray that you will enable all of us to be able to walk with our Lord Jesus Christ, even in these hard times. We thank you so much for everything and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to our God with our applause.